The name Mikasuki translates to King of the Pigs, named for the Native Americans who relied on the wild boar native to southern Georgia and the Florida panhandle in the early 19th century. Along with their relatives in the Seminole Nation, the Mikasuki sided with the British during the American Revolution and the War of 1812. This made them enemy combatants in the eyes of the American people. From 1817 through 1858, three bloody wars, known as the Seminole Wars, fought to remove the Seminole and the Mikasuki to reservations in Oklahoma, or eradicate them altogether. When the fighting had stopped, a few hundred Native Americans still held fast to a stretch of land bordering the Everglades between the present-day cities of Miami and Naples. Their resilience was a point of pride. The Seminole became known as the Unconquered People. Both the Mikasuki and the Seminole remain there to this day, granted their sovereignty in 1957 and 1962. In the 1980s, the Mikasuki tribe of Indians of Florida formed a corporation and began to develop their lands. In time, the tribe's brand would find its way into NASCAR and with one of the sport's most unique personalities. As if by divine retribution, they returned from the brink of extinction in even greater numbers. They arose anger in some, admiration in others, but each knew 2004 was their chance to rise. They were the Field Fillers! James Finch had been involved in construction since he was a teenager. He founded Phoenix Construction Services in 1983 in Lynn Haven, Florida. Finch was also passionate about racing and started fielding cars on local dirt tracks. He then took notice of a young upstart from Tennessee named Jeff Purvis. How did you meet uh, Jeff Purvis? I think J J Jeff raced me about 12 years, I think. You know, on dirt and asphalt, whatever. But I, I met him racing against him in, uh, in the 80s, uh, dirt racing. So who else did you I have to uh, race for you when you are racing against uh, Purvis? Uh, a guy named Buddy Bowell, uh, Billy Moyer, you know, whatever, some of them. But, uh, uh, but we were racing and then I mean, uh, Jeff got hooked up in, uh, I don't know, in the mid 80s, I guess. I guess, you know, uh, won the uh, World, World 100 three times, and uh, then we won, the, uh, that was on dirt, and the Nash, Nashville All American 400, we won it three times on the asphalt short tracking, so. We won a lot, of dirt, a lot of dirt races and a lot of asphalt short track races. Finch and Purvis remained in business for many years to come. It was Purvis who gave the team its first bush start at Charlotte in 1989, their first in Arca at Talladega that same year, and their first cup start at Dover in 1990. In the lower series, the pair quickly found their way to victory lane. In 1993, they won the Arca race at Daytona from the pole. In 1996, they won it again, already the team's eighth arc of victory, and scored their first two Bush Series wins. And Jeff Purvis gets a victory drink here. Hey, uh, glad to see you made it to victory lane. A few extra laps there for you, huh? Never been here before. <laughs> yeah, your first one, Jeff. How's it feel? I'll tell you what, we're tickled to death. You know, we didn't have the fastest race car here, but that doesn't usually, you know, that's not always what wins the races. We had a good race car. It's a brand new car, and we learned something about it all day long, and came up in victory lane. But for Phoenix Racing, the Cup Series was a different animal altogether. While Purvis started all 31 of Finch's Cup points races from 1990 through 1996, he only finished under power 10 times. In fact, he just once finished better than 21st, taking 16th in the 1996 Daytona 500. This included a tragic 1994, where Purvis was called in to complete a season for one of Finch's fallen friends. Neil Bonnet had signed with Finch to run a limited schedule with Country Time as a sponsor, looking to complete his comeback as a driver. But during practice on February 11th, Bonnet was killed after a single car crash in turn four. For the rest of the team's existence, a black banner reading Neil 51 hung at the back of the shop. Yeah, I'd like to dedicate this race to Susan Bonnet. Hopefully she's watching this race in Hueytown and uh, wish she was here and I'll talk to her a little later. and. We appreciate the race. And so from 1997 through 2000, Phoenix Racing didn't start a single cup race and focused primarily on their full-time Bush campaign. Curiously, Purvis didn't start all of those races. 
In 1999, he left to drive for Gary Bechtel, whose technical alliance with Joe Gibbs Racing soon put him in JGR equipment. He crashed in his first start at Daytona. Randy LaJoy, his replacement at Phoenix, took the checkered flag. You know, I got to thank James Finch and Phoenix Construction Racing. These guys are an absolute great race team. Finch and Purvis looked for an opportunity to work together again and found it at the end of the 2000 season. Bill Elliott had long since decided to shut down his owner-driver operation after six winless years in the number 94 McDonald's Ford. As NASCAR's most popular driver prepared to drive Ray Evernham's Dodge factory team in 2001, Bill's brother Ernie Elliott looked to sell his inventory of Ford engines. As much as Bill had struggled in the 2000s season, it was rarely due to a lack of power. He still won his twin 125-mile qualifier that year, finished third in the Daytona 500, and led a combined 83 laps in the four plate races. Such power was invaluable for a team trying to race its way into the Daytona 500 field. Finch bought the engines and prepared cars for Purvis to run in the four plate races. To complete the throwback look, the team would run the same red and white paint scheme that Finch and Purvis drove in their first Daytona 500 start a decade earlier. In the 2001 edition of the Twin 125s, Purvis stayed out under the final Jeff caution. Purvis and Derek Cole are gambling but not stopping for tires, but there's not enough time for 14 cars to pass them. Look at her, look at her. Oh, Earnhardt squeezed between those. He knows he's got to go now. It's tight off there. Boy, that's a lot of cars in one spot. That's an awfully big lead for Sterling to have in turn four there. They can get a run on him. No, I, I, think they got, I think he can hold him off from there. He, got, he can block him enough from there. Three wide. Four back. Felix Sabati's on his feet. They are four wide coming to the line. Gamble paid off, and Purvis raced his way into the Daytona 500. Unfortunately, an early crash left them in last place. The two would go on to qualify for all four plate races that season despite a lack of provisionals and minimal sponsorship. Purvis finished no better than 34th in what turned out to be the last four of his 50 career cup starts. Interestingly, just as in our last two episodes of this series, Brett Bodine played a role in what happened next. That same 2001 season was Brett's last with sponsorship from Ralph Supermarkets. To get his team more attention for potential sponsors, he entered a second car in the night race at Bristol and put brother Jeffrey behind the wheel. Jeffrey ran car number 09 and secured sponsorship of his own from Smirnoff Ice. Helping a major sponsor sign with Brett is the number one priority, said Jeffrey. If we happen to end up with another major sponsor, then I will have a Winston Cup ride in the number 09 car. Jeffrey finished 27th, one spot behind his brother. As it happened, Jeffrey already had a sponsor of his own, at least for the races in Florida. November 15, 1998 at Homestead marked the first ever time the Mikasuki Tribe sponsored a NASCAR team. The Tribe had built a casino on their lands in 1999 and would soon expand to a golf course and airboat rides on the adjoining Everglades. Tribal chairman Billy Cypress entered into an agreement to sponsor Jeffrey's son Barry Bodine at the tribe's home track and homestead, where in the Bush race, the Jim Clark-owned car finished 31st. Father and son both carried the branding for the next few years. Barry made three truck starts with the brand, and the company was on Jeffrey's truck the day of his near-fatal accident at Daytona. On the Cup Series side, Jeffrey then brought the Tribe to Chip McPherson, who bought Cale Yarborough Motorsports, but crashed out of the 2000 Homestead race after 31 laps. The return to Homestead in 01 saw Jeffrey and Brett's second car, and the number 09 finished 37th. Heading into 2002, the brown Mikasuki paint scheme had hopped between five different teams and was on its way toward a sixth. On December 13th, Jeffrey said that he had offers from other teams other than his brothers to run up to 20 cup races in 2002. One of these deals came through five days later, when Jeffrey signed with James Finch to run the Daytona 500. While Jeff Purvis was originally reported to stay on as Jeffrey's teammate, Jeffrey would instead replace Purvis as Finch's driver, bringing with him both the sponsor and car number. Well, was, was there any significance to changing the car number to 09 when Mikasuki was on board? They kind of wanted 09. I wanted, you know, my number was always been 51 or, you know, 15 or number one or, you know, whatever. But uh, I did the 09 for them because they had uh, 
uh, slot machine with some O9s on it or something. It seems like they're fairly secluded. What, what were they looking to accomplish by uh, uh, doing sponsorship in NASCAR? Well, I mean, um, they just, you know, they were they sponsored a lot of stuff you know around florida they did the uh you know the uh big sponsorship for the marlins and big sponsorship for the university of miami and and then the uh the miami heat mark reno finch's bush series crew chief would lead the team the open space at brepodine racing would later go to kirk shelmerdy as it happened, this wasn't the first time Finch had worked with the Mikasuki tribe. Uh, how did you cross paths with the Mikasuki tribe? I worked down there uh, in the uh, Haitian-Cuban crisis in the, uh, I think in about 1980, I was the superintendent down there on the uh, refugee center, and uh, uh, that's when they were uh, filming the movie Scarface, and uh, I, I was the superintendent, and then I built the uh, refugee center on Chrome Avenue, which is close to the Mikasuki uh, tribe. Uh, that's before they had a casino or anything like that. But, uh, you know, I'd work there and I knew a bunch of those Indians. And then, you know, when they come racing or come around to races uh, 20 years later, I seen them and uh, uh, got hooked up with them and I raced with them for a while. The 2002 Daytona 500 marked the first time Jeffrey Bodine started the Great American Race since his truck series wreck just two years earlier. The 1986 winner hadn't finished better than 20th in the race since 1995. There was more adversity this time around. After a poor qualifying run, he incurred a yellow line penalty at the start of his qualifying race and barely made the field on speed. Well, that sure looked like he got pushed out of bounds to me. I mean, it looked like he, he was trying to go there and it looked like Sterling came down and I agree with Wally. And if he does take that penalty, he's basically taking himself out. Of the Daytona, of the 500. Daytona 500. It looks like that Jeffrey Bodine is going to heed that black flag. He's slowing as he comes off turn four. He doesn't have much choice. He either comes in for his penalty or they stop scoring his car and it's not going to do him any good to make laps anyway. So Bodine needs a caution now. He needs to come in and make this stop and have a caution come out to let him catch back up to the field. As a matter of fact, Tony, isn't that almost exactly they burnt? Benny, Jeffrey Bodine is in and he is gone. That's a stop and go penalty. Crew Chief Johnny Allen tried to argue with NASCAR officials against it. He said, bring it on in. Everybody settle down and they're in and out. They need a caution now to catch back up to the field. Starting 35th on Sunday, he damaged the left front corner of his car and was running 31st before the big one happened in turn one. He then climbed into the top five in the final laps and enjoyed his best race in over two years. The first two have never won the 500. The second two have won it four times between them. Two laps to go as they come to the start finish line. Eighth two times is his best previous finish in the 500. Now in his eighth try at the Great American Race, it's going to be Ward Burton driving his Dodge to victory lane. On, Checkered flag on. is up and Ward Burton is going to win the 44th Daytona 500. Jeffrey Bodine's third place finish in the Daytona 500 was a key turning point in Phoenix Racing's Cup Series program. From there, they began to turn in the same strong performances they had experienced in both Arca and Bush. In that same 2002 season, Jeffrey finished 12th at Talladega and 10th under the lights at Daytona, where he started outside pole. In 2003, Finch bought Buckshot Jones's shop in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and teamed up with Chip Ganassi Racing. Jamie McMurray, then a rookie for Ganassi, swept the Bush season at Rockingham in what were already the 9th and 10th series wins for Phoenix Racing. The Ganassi deal brought something altogether new to Finch, manufacturer support. While manufacturer-specific decals became commonplace in 1997, Finch refused to run them on his cars if he didn't receive any help from Ford, Dodge, or General Motors. I heard that it was that you didn't get as much manufacturer support from, say, Ford compared to Dodge. Was that was that the case? Well, you know, Ford. I got some for Chevrolet, you know, and I just I, ne I never did get much help from any of them. Chevrolet, you know, at the last, you know, they finally helped me some, but. Uh, you know, I'd get Victory Lane, and, and uh, they'd all come running in Victory Lane, and when I'd ask them for some help, you know, they would swear, well, we'll see what we can do about our budget next year, so I'd run their ass out of Victory Lane, you know. Told them to take the damn, take the damn hats and stick it, you know, get the hell out of there. Proudly carrying Dodge branding on the cup side for Finch was Mike Wallace, fastest in winter testing. Wallace piloted the car to a ninth place finish in the rain shortened Daytona 500, 10th at Talladega, and even 12th at Richmond. In early 2004, Dodge continued to support Phoenix Racing, but Finch lost the Ganassi deal to Braun Racing. 
to be pure and simple about it, said Mark Reno, if they're not going to put support behind him, we're not going to train their rookie for them. We're going to put a veteran in and race. That veteran was Johnny Benson Jr., who had just lost his full-time ride with MB2 Motorsports with one year still left on his contract. This time, Finch would enter him in both the full-time Bush car and part-time Cup car. The Mikasuki sponsorship remained. They would commit to a paint scheme they debuted the year before, black with bands of red and yellow matching the tribal logo. On January 14, 2004, it was announced that Benson would run seven cup races, both races at Daytona, Talladega, and Richmond, plus the March race in Las Vegas. The schedule was still subject to change, but unlikely to extend. At the time, Phoenix Racing had never started more than seven cup races in a season, and ran the same track so often that they'd never even started a cup race on 13 of the 23 scheduled tracks. Three of those 13 wouldn't see a James Finch car in the lineup until 2009. In other cases, they've been absent for many years. They hadn't run Dover since their cup debut in 1990. They hadn't run at Atlanta or Michigan since 95. And after qualifying at Indianapolis in 2002, didn't even enter in 2003. No one would have expected the team to enter 29 of the 36 races, nor qualify for 26 of them, yet that's exactly what happened. Johnny Benson Jr. qualified 24th for the Daytona 500, which was actually the best start the Cup team would have all year. In the 500, he was collected in the big one, and finished just 27th. Like many of Finch's cars at the time, Benson's had been tested by another series veteran in Joe Rutman. At 59 years old, Rutman had been running cup races since January 20th, 1963, when the Grand National Series rolled into the Riverside International Raceway in his native California. Driving alongside his older brother Troy, the 1952 Indianapolis 500 winner, Joe finished a surprising 10th, just seven spots behind. Later in his career, the Californian had come brutally close to scoring his first Cup Series victory. In 1982 at Richmond, he was leading when a tire cut down, causing him to crash. The rain fell soon after, handing the shortened win to Dave Marcus. In the same race four years later, he couldn't avoid the carnage triggered by Dale Earnhardt and Darrell Waltrip, knocking him out of the race as Kyle Petty took his first win. He was there again in the 1991 Daytona 500, enjoying a strong run for Raymock Enterprises, but came up just short of challenging Ernie Irvin. His last cup start came in the same race four years later, driving for Stanton Hover in 1995. That didn't stop James Finch from approaching Rutman in the team hauler on the morning of the Daytona 500, asking about his active NASCAR license. Finch had Rutman fill out an entry blank for the next week's race in Rockingham, where he'd run the number 09 in Benson's place. The official reason was because Benson would be ineligible for additional provisionals if he climbed higher than 35th in the driver points. By February 18th, Rutman's name was on the entry list, though the Mikizugi sponsorship wasn't listed. It would be Rutman's first cup start at Rockingham since 1991, and one of his first trips there since serving as Kenny Irwin Jr.'s driver coach in 98. While it's popularly believed that Rutman was pulled out of retirement to run at Rockingham, this simply wasn't true. In 1995, the same year he made his last cup start, he was a series regular in the new NASCAR Super Truck Series, where he scored a pair of wins at Bristol and Martinsville. He'd won another 11 times since, not only at three different road courses, but also the 2001 opener at Daytona. He'd also made four Bush Series starts since 01, yielding a best of 21st at Pikes Peak. He even made an ARCA start at Chicagoland in 2003, starting 4th and finishing 19th for the Rulo brothers. While testing Finch's cars at Daytona for the 2003 Pepsi 400, Rutman was eager to race Cup again. When asked if he was interested, he said, quote, Are you kidding me? I keep thinking each year, maybe this is my year to try it. Much of this would be overlooked because of what unfolded on February 22nd, 2004. For Rockingham, the Cup team was very much an afterthought to Finch's full-time Bush Series ride. While the crew for the Bush team had to wear business attire on the flight to the track, the Cup crew showed up wearing cut-off jeans and tank tops. The Cup car Rutman would drive, chassis number 045, was nicknamed Easy Money. Well, what was your reason for bringing Rutman on board uh, to do the start and park? No, he was just a friend of, uh, friend of ours, and, uh, you know, when I was racing, my my bush car at the time so we just needed a you know pretty good driver you know to qualify it and park it it is true that the team had planned to start and park their car but there's more to the story 
According to Twitter user Start and Park Car's interview with James Finch and Mark Reno, the plan was for Rutman to complete the first half of the 393-lap race. The team had exactly two sets of sticker tires for the weekend, which was why Rutman didn't participate in either practice session. When two late withdrawals left the entry list at exactly 43 drivers for 43 spots, Rutman stretched his first set even further, with a single qualifying lap of just 25.225 seconds, nearly two full seconds off Ryan Newman's pole lap. A few more members of Benson's Over the Wall crew would stay on to pit Rutman's car on Sunday, when he'd roll off 40th in the field. On race morning, the team had their one remaining set of sticker tires in their pit stall, along with a box where Finch was seated testing the radio. Rutman's car made it through inspection, made it out onto the grid, and the crew strapped their driver in. But apparently the car was parked so far from their pit stall that the race started before they got there. NASCAR, believing Rutman took the green without a pit crew, parked the number 09 after just one lap. The crew had already pulled behind the wall as the confused crew arrived at their stall. NASCAR then confiscated their one remaining set of tires and prevented him from returning to the track. James Finch offered further clarification as to why this decision had been made so quickly. Uh, I was there. I was on the pole at the Bush race with Johnny Benson. Mm -hmm. They didn't have enough. They didn't have enough Cup cars there. And back then, you had a Friday and a Saturday qualifying. So I told him, I said, "Go back and get a Cup car and bring it back, and uh, let's start and park it because it was I don't know seventy five, seventy six thousand dollars for last place or something." And so, so uh, we went and qualified, paid in. The late entry qualified the car with Joe Rudman, put Joe in it, and uh, uh, made a couple laps. But in the meantime, all the officials were coming down there raising hell about where the pit crew was. And I said, well, if you got a pit crew, and I didn't know if they were going to say, you can't start a race without the pit crew. And I said, yeah, I got one somewhere, but they must be at the concession stand. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, so he made a couple laps and come back. We got the $76,000. The result was a field day for the sanctioning body and media alike. While Finch's car wasn't the only one to park that afternoon, Kirk Shelverdine ran just 18 more laps, they became the season's first scapegoat, the new field filler controversy. Most took particular issue with the amount of money the team had made for so short of a run, $54,196, rather than try to understand the circumstances that led to their early exit. The moment would reverberate through much of the season, particularly in how underfunded teams were perceived. Jim Hunter, NASCAR's vice president, said, quote, The Joe Rutman thing was sort of a sham. We always try to do the right thing, and since we had let it go that far, we let him start the race. However, that will not happen again. If we know somebody's doing that, we're not going to allow that. Curiously, this wouldn't be the last time a team was parked for this, as it happened to Mike Wallace and Gunselman Racing at Pocono in 2009. To this day, it's still unclear whether Wallace's incident played out the same way Finch and Reno described theirs. By March 2nd, the rhetoric had shifted toward whether NASCAR was pushing out older drivers. NASCAR has suggested to many, many people, that some drivers cut back to partial schedules, said Rusty Wallace that might happen one of these days. For Wallace, that day had already come. Before Dale Earnhardt's death, Bill France Jr. had been pressuring him to retire. By the end of 2004, he'd follow through with those plans, announcing his last call tour for 2005. NASCAR threatened to fine James Finch for not having a pit crew, but when Finch pointed out rightly that there was no such rule, he was admonished instead to make sure he brought a pit crew from then on. Mark Reno confirmed they did in fact have a pit crew for the following race in Las Vegas, where Johnny Benson would drive once more. While Reno indicated that they'd pull Benson off the track if he got in the way of the series regulars, he voiced his displeasure at the field filler label. We're ahead of Michael Waltrip in the 99 car and owner points right now. What does that make them? Benson finished 31st, four laps down. And then I told Mark, my crew chief, I said, how much do you owe on your house? And he said, oh, you know, a couple hundred thousand. I said, well, we'll do three more starting parks and pay your house off. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's what we did. And a bunch of people started doing the starting parks. And uh, later on, later on, I quit that and, you know, went to racing, you know, uh, full time. And then before I was running the ones I wanted to and I could afford to run, you know, because, you know, with a, the engine rent was $100,000 and the tire bill was $20,000 a race. And so, uh, and you're paying 80, so you know how many you want to tackle, you know? And so um, it was pretty tough, to, uh, pretty tough to maintain up there. Rutman took over the next three races at Atlanta, Darlington, and Bristol. Each time he lined up 40th and completed no more than 22 laps. 
At Bristol on March 28th, Fox's cameras caught the number 09 pulling behind the wall on lap 6. By then, Finch said he had enough sponsorship to run his cup car in 12 races, and would continue to add more events if he could. I made more money per lap for running four laps at Bristol than Kurt Busch got from winning, said Finch. Jayski crunched the numbers, showing the clear financial incentive for some teams to exit early. Rutman was slated to run Texas on April 4th, but Benson drove there instead. They made it halfway through the race this time, but fell out with rear-end trouble, leaving them 34th. Rutman took over at Martinsville, where he dropped out after two laps with, of all things, brake issues as a listed reason. It was Benson again during a particularly crash-filled Talladega race on April 25th, where the number 09 held fast to the 19th spot with 40 laps to go. Moments later, a suspension issue put him out of the race, though the 29th place finish was the team's best run since the Daytona 500. Fontana on May 2nd saw the two drivers swap again, this time Rutman taking over for Benson. The result was the same. Rutman turned just two laps, citing a vibration. Just 10 races into the season, Rutman had still scored exactly half of the last place finishes and appeared set for a convincing victory in the 2004 Last Car Cup Series Championship. But Rutman would drive the car just one more time the rest of the season, allowing the Arnold Motorsports team to mount their late season charge. Johnny Benson's time with Finch ended on May 10th following a blown engine in the Bush race at Gateway. The remainder of the Bush season would be completed by nine different drivers with varying degrees of success. Jimmy McMurray earned a season best second for the team at Charlotte the night Kyle Busch took his second Busch Series win. Three other drivers were series veterans making their return. Buckshot Jones finished 29th at Nashville and 38th at Kentucky, his first starts in the series in nearly three years. Bobby Hamilton also made his first Busch start since 2001 by finishing 16th at IRP. He also reunited one more time with Jeff Purvis, which was perhaps the most significant. In 2002, Purvis nearly lost his life in a savage accident at Nazareth. Finch fielded a car for Purvis to run there again just two years later. He finished 17th in what turned out to be his final start in NASCAR competition. Why, why do you want to come back? I'll tell you something. I, I, I really, truly, I do this because I love it. I like doing it. I don't like running like I did today. But, you know, I hadn't been in a race car in two, two years. And so for me to come out here and think that I was going to sit on the pole, which I really did think, and, uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, this is, this is not an easy sport. This is what people need to understand. It, it's, it's more like golf than it is riding a bicycle. Before he left Phoenix Racing, Benson had a successful test with the team at Richmond, and James Finch set to work finding a driver to run the number 09. On May 11th, just one day after Benson's departure, Finch signed Bobby Hamilton Jr. The second-generation driver was sitting eighth in the Bush Series standings for Team Renzi Motorsports. It was Hamilton who gave Renzi his only two cup starts the previous year, even qualifying 18th and finishing 14th in their debut at Kansas. He didn't disappoint at Richmond. This time, he put up the 26th fastest lap and finished 17th, the team's best finish of the season so far. He also completed all but one of the laps in a race that saw only 11 drivers on the same lap as leader. How about Bobby Hamilton Jr., just in front of the race leader? He's been battling Rusty Wallace for 16th spot, and he's done a, a great job tonight in James Finch's car. He's kept his nose clean, stayed on the lead lap for well over half the race. Phoenix Racing elected not to run the next tell open at Charlotte, but did enter Hamilton again in the Coca-Cola 600. On qualifying day, however, Hamilton had an obligation with Team Renzi, so the team needed another hot shoe in time trials. They picked 24-year-old Shane Meal, who was running Greg Mixon's Bush car that weekend, and qualified the car 31st on the grid. Hamilton returned for Sunday, but had a short night, out after 73 laps with handling woes. Meal would go on to make his first five cup starts late in the 2004 season, all in the unsponsored number 23 for Bill Davis Racing. He finished the best of 24th at both Kansas and Atlanta. For the first time since Finch debuted his cup team in 1990, he entered his car at Dover and once again tabbed a different driver. This time, it was Tony Raines, set to make his first cup start since Base Motorsports shut down their unsponsored number 74. Raines took 35th in qualifying, but ended up on the same plan as Joe Rutman. After 50 laps, he was done for the day, out with handling issues. This turned out to be the only time Finch would enter his cup car for the rest of the month. 
They skipped the following three races in Pocono, Michigan, and Sears Point. I asked Finch why he avoided the road courses in particular until 2009. Well, it was uh, so expensive and they, they didn't pay much, you know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, if I had to, you know, watch what money I spent, well, you know, hell, if I wasn't paying my bills, I wouldn't have worried about it, so I didn't want to do that, but you can't last long doing that. July 3rd marked NASCAR's return to Daytona for the Pepsi 400. Bobby Hamilton Jr. would make his first Super Speedway start in the Cup Series in nearly three years. He would do so with a backup carburetor, as officials confiscated his for unapproved alterations. Fellow Dodge driver Casey Mears was docked for the same thing. Hamilton qualified 28th, but cut a left rear tire and spun in the tri-oval, leaving him just 42nd. The team tried a different strategy the next week in Chicagoland, picking up one of Ed Renzi's old cup cars and reskinning it from a Ford into a Dodge. Back behind the wheel of a chassis he'd already raced a year earlier, Hamilton qualified 28th, but the engine let go after only 86 laps, leaving him 41st. The following race at Loudoun, New Hampshire on July 25th was a much needed turnaround. For the third straight race, Hamilton qualified 28th, and this time gave Phoenix Racing its first lead lap finish of 2004. In fact, they finished 19th, just two spots short of Hamilton's breakout run at Richmond. James Finch didn't enter his team the next week at Pocono, and on August 3rd brought on yet another driver in Scott Pruitt. This was a rare turn for Pruitt, who since his difficult rookie season in 2000 had not run a cup race on an oval track since. He'd become Chip Ganassi's road course ringer since then, finishing runner-up to Robbie Gordon at Watkins Glen in 2003, then in June of 2004 took home third behind teammate Jimmy McMurray and a dominant Jeff Gordon. But around 2.30 on the afternoon of Friday, August 6th, this happened. You have to be perfect, but like I said, this is a big event. We see a lot of guys, we see Pruitt uh, got around, got lost. Pruitt was taken from the infield care center to Methodist Hospital. After further evaluation and x-rays, he was released later that day and returned to try and get Finch's backup car up to speed. Wincing in pain, Pruitt turned the slowest lap in Saturday practice, made it through qualifying, then flew to mid-Ohio to prepare for the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series race. On Sunday, he elected to park Finch's car after nine laps, citing engine trouble. Later that day, Pruitt dug deep, and with teammate Max Pappas won the mid-Ohio race. The two would go on to claim the series championship. Phoenix Racing didn't run their own road race at Watkins Glen, and returned with Hamilton at Michigan, a track they skipped in June. Engine trouble past the halfway point left them at the tail end once again, this time in 38th. This ended up being Hamilton's final cup start with the team. He'd be replaced at Bristol with a familiar face in Mike Wallace, who at Indy had lost his ride at Arnold Motorsports to Todd Bodine. On lap 57, Wallace was running in the high lane around Jeff Burton and Ricky Rudd when they made contact. Oh, there we go. What was I saying? Uh, something about getting in a bunch, something bad happens. Ricky Rudd squeezed into the wall and the caution flag is out. Despite heavy damage to both sides of the car that left him 32 laps down, Wallace still finished a solid 28th. Joe Rutman had been expected to return for the inaugural fall race at Fontana, but the team withdrew and set their sights on returning to Richmond. Mike Wallace would drive there too, and sought to improve on Bobby Hamilton Jr.'s performance there in May. They would do so in one of the most anticipated races of the new chase format, the cutoff race on September 11th. It already promised to be a big weekend for Phoenix Racing. For the first and only time, they would field a truck series entry. They brought on Jimmy Spencer, who earlier that season had been rumored as a possible driver of Finch's Cup car. In the same race that saw the debut of Jermaine Arnold Racing, Spencer qualified sixth, just three spots behind Bodine. Engine trouble in the final laps left him back in 28th. In the Cup race, Wallace started a distant 41st. NASCAR confiscated unapproved fender braces from his Dodge. He stayed out under the third caution and took over the lead on lap 54. When the green flag flew five laps later, it seemed certain he dropped back through the field. Wallace will put the caution and come back around and rejoin that lead lap. Oh. Wow, we're going to be Mayfield all over the back bumper of Mike Wallace. Instead, he held off eventual race winner Jeremy Mayfield for 45 laps, playing keep away with his critical five bonus points. Jeremy Mayfield still trying his best to get by. Mike Wallace can't do it. Mike's doing a good job. He's doing a fantastic job. That car ran well in practice yesterday. 
And that's how much, that right there, this is how important track position is. You see, what, we didn't even know where Mike was before that caution, but he stayed out. He's got a, you know, pretty good race car, and he's staying up front. As we've got a battle for the lead, guys. And Jeremy Mayfield let a lap. How about that? Five bonus points. He finally got the nose under Mike Wallace and got the runoff turn four. And he had better go to that lead now because there's a new third place runner and closing quickly. In the final laps, Wallace was still running in seventh, but because of Finch's past work with Chip Ganassi, there were rumors that he'd pull out of line to help ninth place Jamie McMurray make it into the chase. But that did not happen. So he is running in eighth place now and can't afford to give up any spots. And that's Mike Wallace right behind him in the 09, running ninth, trying to take a spot away and some of those oh so precious points. Yeah, and he's catching them really, really fast. Marty, got problems? He is on seven cylinders. Jamie McMurray on seven cylinders, Wally. Yep, that, you can tell how fast Mike Wallace was coming up on the 42 car. Jamie's got trouble. The result was James Finch's best finish at the time on a non-super speedway, and Wallace's best since he was runner-up at Phoenix three years earlier. The following race at New Hampshire saw Wallace nearly complete the full distance again, but he dropped out with crash damage in the final 44 laps, leaving him 34th. Joe Ruttman returned the next week at Dover, which was his first start in the number 09 since the spring race at Fontana. He ran two qualifying laps that were each within one one-thousandth of each other, but turned only 27 laps and finished 41st. Mike Wallace returned to action at Talladega, and for the second time in four races gave Phoenix Racing a lead lap finish. He avoided the chaos on the last lap and took home 18th. Phoenix Racing didn't run the following race at Kansas, and when they arrived for Charlotte in mid-October, they'd hired yet another driver. Johnny Sauter had signed with Richard Childress Racing to compete for Rookie of the Year, but after a difficult stretch of races, he was released after the 13th round in Dover. While he returned to his focus on the Bush Series for Bruco Motorsports, he was brought on by Finch to run the rest of the season. At Charlotte, Sauter ran a solid 24th, completing all but five laps. The team then skipped Martinsville and failed to qualify at Atlanta before returning at Phoenix. He qualified 30th and was in the thick of a battle late in the race when he lost control off the dogleg. All right, and it is the 09. Johnny Sauter. I'm pretty sure he got run into. Heavy damage on the right front of the 09. Sauter then finished 29th at Darlington, four laps down, and after issues during inspection, failed to qualify once again at Homestead. Sauter returned for another part-time schedule with Phoenix Racing in 2005. With 15 laps to go in dual race one, Sauter ducked back onto the track at the last minute and inherited the lead. Stop, it was Hermie Sadler who stayed out. All right, remember, I talked about desperation. Remember, Johnny Sauter in the 09 car, he is not in the race or was not in the race where he was running. They followed everyone to pit road, and at the last minute before the commit cone, he drove back out on the racetrack. The thing he has to do, Daryl, if he possibly can, if that car will let him, is especially through the corners, run the bottom. Hug that yellow line. Yeah, I think so. And, and really, he's in pretty good shape because the guys that are around him right now aren't any faster than he is. The fast guys are coming up on him. The question is, can they get to him? You know who's loving this? Johnny Sauter. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so look at this. So many times the best racing of Speedweeks has been right here on Thursday. Big crowd on hand to see it. And after Sauter, they're two wide, then three, then three, then two, then three. Wow. Well, when they've got on four fresh tires, you can expect this kind of action. The thing about it is, uh, they get the, the longer they run, the worse the cars get to handling, and the more reckless they get. With six laps to go, he was still near the final transfer spot when the car began to trail smoke. The crew chief on the 09, Tony Liberati. Tony, what happened to the race car? Well, you know, we had to roll the dice and just do what we could do to get in this race. Uh, and we had to race. So Johnny's doing a heck of a job. And uh, the motor just let go on us, and that's pretty much it. The motor let go, and uh, I'm pretty sure we would have made it in. We got another motor for the 500. Um, guys back at the shop work real good. You know, the, the motor's been strong all weekend, and uh, we've been struggling a little bit, and I thought, you know, we made that call to stay out, and uh, I thought it was going to be good, and, and we ended up uh, blowing up there towards the end, so I guess we're probably going to have to load up and go home. For the rest of the season, Sauter qualified for 10 of his 18 attempts. At Phoenix, he finished ninth then was 16th at Talladega, 17th at Daytona, and 16th again at Charlotte. He also won the Bush race at the Milwaukee Mile. Phoenix scaled back to eight and six starts in 2006 and 2007. Both years, Mike Wallace raced his way into the Daytona 500. 
He finished 24th in 06, then the next year avoided the big last lap pileup to finish 4th. No caution! They're side by side, right to the line! Big crash, here they come, checkered flag! wins the Daytona 500. Near the end of 2007, the team picked up Sterling Marlin after the collapse of Ginn Racing. Marlin qualified for seven of his 10 attempts in 2008, but missed the Daytona 500 and finished no better than 22nd. This brings us to 2009, where Phoenix Racing finally attempted the entire cup schedule for the very first time. That year, Marlin was one of seven different drivers to make at least one attempt. And one of the newest was a kid named Brad Keselowski. Can Keselowski try to win it? I don't know. I don't think he can step out until he waits till the last second and picks he up. He goes to the other side. Is Edwards going to oh, no. He turns it. No, no. Oh, and that no. destroyed the front end of Newman's car. No. Edwards will not make it to the flag. Oh, Brad no. Keselowski won this race. Talladega turned out to be Finch's only cup win as a team owner. For 2010, he had a contract with the Mikasuki tribe to run the full nationwide series season with James Busher and 18 cup races with Eric Almirola. The tribe also signed with Almirola to run full time in the truck series for Kyle Busch Motorsports. But on February 8th, both deals were nixed by Collie Billy, the tribe's newly elected chairman, as a cost saving measure. Finch decided not to contest the contract he still held with the tribe. They're not going to do anything, said Finch. We had a contract, but our only recourse is to go in front of the tribal council, and that's not a case I'm going to win. As a result, while Almirola still ran the full truck series season, he often start and parked in Cup. James Busher ran only the first 10 races of the nationwide season before he handed the wheel to Ryan Newman. While the nationwide program scaled back to a partial schedule again, Phoenix Racing's Cup team stayed full-time for the next four seasons. They did so with little sponsorship, aided by the likes of Landon Castle and Mike Bliss, then in 2012 picked up a wayward Kurt Busch. And uh, to me and Kurt, Bush went out to uh, Sonoma and run second and third there, wow. you know. Um, That's right. And um, I, I got a car from Rick. Rick, I said, Rick, I, you got a car you ain't using. You know, it's got, I don't want to have you know, uh, an old road race car. I said, yeah, I got one I had run a couple of years. Uh, you know, Rick, come get it. So we, we went and got the thing and cleaned it up, you know, and it had the right-hand side fuel deal in it, you know, instead of the left-hand side. We cleaned it up. And, I think went out there and qualified eighth or ninth or something, and uh, uh, him and uh, Jimmy and all of them been been testing road racing for two or three a weeks, you know, two or three days a week. And so we took that car, started ninth, run up the second, and run second about all day, and then finally uh, he hit the he hit a knocked the rear end sideways in it with two or three laps to go, and Tony Stewart got by us and we run third. But we drove from ninth past Jimmy and Jeff and drove off, drove off 16 seconds. And Rick looked over me, so we're not testing them down more. We're not road racing. <laughs> <laughs> it was Bush who gave Finch his 13th and final Xfinity win at Daytona on July 6, 2012. Bliss, who claimed the team's most recent win in the series before that, gave the team its final cup start at Atlanta, finishing 33rd on September 1, 2013. By then, the team had been sold to Harry Scott Jr., whose H. Scott Motorsports team only made it three more seasons. But anyway, we had a good time. Rick, Rick Hendrick helped me a lot. I mean, he was he was really a good friend and a real nice guy. I mean, he just I just love that guy. And uh, hey, uh, I, I was gonna quit, and he said, "Man, don't quit. You know, whatever. You know, whatever." And I said, "Well, hell, Rick, you gotta help me." He said, "Well, I'll help you." You want to come out? A couple of years later, I said, "Don't help me no more. Please don't help me no more. I'm going home." <laughs> <laughs> Today, Finch remains very active both in the construction business and his race team. Most recently, in this year's Snowball. Derby. I was, you know, I probably was the longest independent, you know, and more successful, I guess, than most independents. And um, they won the ARCA Super Speedway Championship three times, me and Purvis, and then uh, 13 uh, Bush Grand National races, and, and then I won a cup race, uh, short track racing. Uh, well, I'm back short track racing now with my son. Uh, we're, we're running the Snowball Derby this weekend. And he's been running the Outlaw, and I moved him up to the Pro. Uh, this year built 
two supers for next year for him and uh, so I, I told him I would let him run the snowball derby this year that he would run the pro race you know the event before the uh, snowball but the two cars I had ready for him I put two other drivers in for the snowball derby in those cars well he's, he's 15 and I just started him uh, off you know he turned 15 in June and I started him off last year when he's 14, 14 and so he's been really doing good and uh, so I'll move him up to the main event uh, next year in, in January or February. I'll take him to Speed Weeks in New Smyrna for eight or ten nights there. While more than seven years have passed since James Finch last fielded an entry in NASCAR, another team from 2004 was seen just nine months ago and is now preparing to make a comeback. Qualifying presented by Pizza Hut live on NBC from Daytona Beach, Florida. Larry Foyt coming around to complete his second qualifying lap was 36th on his first lap, 36th of the 45 cars that have made a run. And he goes up to the 29th position, 48-615. In America, there exists a sport that is driven by the fans. They are why everyone works so hard on the teams and at the tracks, in front of the grandstands and behind the scenes to give the fans the greatest race possible. NASCAR fans deserve the best, starting from the high banks of Daytona all the way to the shores of California and at every race in between. NASCAR fans, you're the reason for our success. Thanks. <laughs> 